Welcome back to the Fairbank Center's series on critical issues for contemporary China. Michael Zoni, the center director, sends his greetings. I'm Bill Overholt, a senior research fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School. It's a pleasure and a challenge to introduce Joseph Nye. What else does one say about someone whose colleagues in international relations rank him as the number one most important scholar in the field and who has served as chair of the National Intelligence Council and in some of the most important Department of Defense positions, as well as leading Harvard's Kennedy School. Let me highlight a couple things. One is the way his dual careers in government and academia have benefited both the country and scholarship. Uh, many international relations scholars have interesting, well-documented ideas, but trying to implement them and then live with the consequences is the most severe peer review uh, ever designed. Professor Nye's ideas endure because they're disciplined by a harsher reality than regressions. Uh, conversely, most government officials live each day overwhelmed by multiple crises, by a mountain of paperwork, personnel problems, and demands to say politically convenient things. Uh, but Joe Nye entered each position having reflected deeply about the historical context and the long run consequences of decisions. Decisions he made long ago are remarkably still respected because he brought long range vision to a government mostly driven by today's inbox. I'll highlight just one other thing, professional aplomb. In the Carter administration, Joe was sent to uh, Japan to persuade them to abandon a nuclear reprocessing facility. Uh, the Japanese government very much wanted to keep that facility. I happen to be consulting about nuclear strategy and uh, nuclear proliferation at the time, and also was working closely with the Japanese government. So I had a front row uh, seat as the government, the Japanese government launched a, a campaign of personal vilification against Joe Nye. Uh, it was really vicious. I thought this guy is gonna hate Japan for the rest of his life but I never saw any personal reaction, only total professionalism. He positioned himself then and ever since as a friend of Japan, a supporter of the Japanese American Alliance. Years later, the emperor of Japan awarded him Japan's highest honor, the Order of the Rising Sun. He provides a model of dignity and professionalism that most of us ordinary people uh, can only aspire to, very rarely achieve. Joe, over to you. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Bill, for that um, generous introduction. It's also amusing to be reminded of that uh, situation back in the Carter administration. You're right. I was pretty unpopular for a while. <laughs> um, but today I'm going to talk about <clears throat> China, not, not Japan, or indirectly it involves Japan. And uh, I'm also going to try to uh, divide the time we have together uh, in half. Um, the dangerous professors can talk forever. Um, and I want to make sure there's lots of time for questions and answers, which is, I think, the most interesting part of sessions like this. So 
as I mentioned earlier, if, if I go on past the halfway mark, shut me up. <laughs> but because uh, I do want the Q&A. In any case, uh, talking about uh, the US and China, and then I'll talk a little bit about the lessons of history involved. But if you look at the period we're going through now, um, uh, it's probably uh, the worst relations that we've seen between the United States and China uh, in 50 years. It's kind of interesting if you think back historically, uh, US-China relations have gone in cycles of roughly two decades, uh, uh, right after the, the um, uh, communists took power in 1949, we had two decades in which we even went to war with each other. Um, and then you had following the, uh, the Nixon visit with Mao, you had two decades of being basically aligned against the Soviet Union. And then two decades after that, you had the period of engagement, which, which wound up with the United States um, uh, sponsoring China's entry into the World Trade Organization. And then for the last, um, I would say, five years or so, uh, we've seen a downturn. Now, a lot of people say that's, um, you know, because of Trump. But in fact, it, it's more than just because of Trump. It's, it's something that's bipartisan. Uh, if you look at the uh, public opinion uh, polls in the United States, uh, they've changed quite dramatically from, you know, a third with a uh, uh, a negative view on China today is, and uh, are in, in the past going up to two thirds today. And that's a, that's a significant change. Uh, some people say that that's all because of Trump, but um, I would argue that the Chinese bear a good part of the cause of this. I, I use the analogy that Trump is like a uh, a boy who comes along and sees a fire smoldering and he pours gasoline on the fire. Uh, but you have to ask who lit the fire in the first place. And I think the fire was lit um, basically after 2008 when Chinese elites, starting with Hu Jintao, but greatly accentuated later by Xi Jinping, come to the conclusion as a result of the 2008 financial crisis that the United States is in decline and that they can press harder and that they can uh, basically um, drop Deng Xiaoping's cautious policies and can essentially push for a, a, a greater a place. And I think this is aided and abetted by Chinese nationalism. I think the, the fact that uh, the legitimacy of the Communist Party has been a a legitimacy based on high rates of economic growth. And as the rates of economic growth slow down, I think that's been replaced by nationalism as a legitimizing force. But whatever these ultimate causes, I think the, the problems in the US-China relationship, uh, which we're seeing today, and I don't, whether, don't know whether it's gonna be another 20 year cycle like the ones I mentioned earlier, uh, or shorter or longer, but the, uh, the problems have a lot to do with China as well as with the US. And I, I try to make a point of telling that to my Chinese friends who, who often say, oh, well, it's because of Trump. It's much more important than that. The, the interesting thing is that uh, if you look at Xi Jinping's uh, period uh, since 2013, uh, you could almost imagine him um, uh, having a a little red hat that says, make China great again. Um, and that uh, uh, his China dream, which basically is displacing the US as the leading country by the 100th anniversary of Communist Party rule in 2049, um, it, who knows, will he or won't he? And there is where I wanna focus uh, my talk of how do, we, how do we think ahead to see whether uh, whether that is a plausible outcome, A, and B, uh, how we should respond to it. Um, nobody knows what the future will be. Uh, when I was running the National Intelligence Council that does uh, intelligence estimates for the president, um, I used to always tell the analysts, there is no one future. There are an infinite number of possible futures, 
some of which are more probable than others, and some of which we can affect by our actions, others which we probably can't. And therefore, as you think about the poor decision maker, uh, you have to be sympathetic of how can he or she uh, make sense of this. And there, I think, um, what you see is that decision makers in Washington often turn to what they think of uh, as lessons of history uh, to guide policy. And uh, if you, uh, you know, you, you always have to be careful of lessons of history because uh, Mark Twain perhaps apocryphally said, history never repeats itself. At best, it sometimes rhymes. Um, but uh, our, our, our former colleague, Ernest May, uh, did this very well in which he said, whenever you're using a historical analogy to guide policy, uh, take out a three by five card, draw a line down the middle, and on one side of the line, put things that are similar, on the other side, put things that are different, and then ask what you can learn about policy, uh, how these differences and similarities uh, uh, total up. Right now in Washington, there, there are probably three major historical analogies that are, that are going, uh, uh, that are shaping policy or that are popular, not just among policymakers, but editorial writers and so forth. And one of them is um, uh, what's called the Thucydides trap, uh, as my colleague Graham Allison has dubbed it. Um, another is Cold War II, which is actually somewhat more popular. And a third is uh, 1914 and sleepwalking into World War. So let me talk about each of those briefly, and then we can uh, do some conclusions and ask what has changed or not changed as a result of the Russian invasion of, uh, of uh, Ukraine, uh, and then throw it open for Q and A. Uh, the Thucydides trap is is. Uh, based on the idea that uh, when a rising power challenges an established power, it's a recipe for war. Uh, this is named after Thucydides because he, uh, after studying the Peloponnesian War in which the Greek city-state system tore itself apart, um, said it wasn't this little cause or that little cause. The real cause of the war was the rise in the power of Athens and the fear that created in Sparta. Um, and the analogy, of course, would be uh, if we have a conflict or a war with China, it will be caused by the rise of the power of China and the fear that creates in the US, particularly in Washington, DC. Um, Graham Allison has tried to, uh, uh, to quantify this. He, he looked at historical cases since 1500 in which you've had a rising power and a and a challenging and established power and he comes to the conclusion that three quarters of them result in war 12 out of his 16 cases uh graham's a good friend but i've told him that uh, i don't think his numbers add up uh, i don't think he has 16 cases there are either many more or many fewer it's not at all clear what's a case or not. For example, in the 19th century, uh, Britain was generally uh, this, accepted as the established power by the middle of the 19th century. And Prussia um, became a very clear rising power. And uh, there were three wars in the, in the 1860s to 1870 period in which uh, Bismarck used to increase the strength of Prussia, Germany, um, and the British sat aside. They didn't, didn't do anything about it. And uh, so if they were an established power watching a rising power, they had opportunity to, to stop the rising power, but they didn't. Now, some people say, oh, but it's all one case, uh, all because eventually in 1914, the British and the Germans did go to war. But that's, that's a bit too simple. To lump together that much history and call it one case is, is not, to my mind, convincing. But any point, it's, let's not get bogged down in the details. The important point is that 
this idea that there's a 75% chance that uh, a rising power, established power relationship uh, becomes uh, a war is, I think, not right. Uh, Graham put the title on his book, or maybe his publisher put the title of his book, Destined for War. Um, I think there should have at least have been a question mark on, on that. But in any case, um, that analogy is one that is taken on certain legs. Um, and uh, even Xi Jinping has referred to the Thucydides trap. Um, and there are a number of people, I've run into a number of senators and others who say, oh, well, as this shows, and it doesn't show that. Um, indeed, even if you go back to the original historical analogy of Thucydides, uh, Donald Kagan, the former dean at, at Yale, uh, but famous uh, classicist of the Greek period, uh, argues that it, it, it's not a, that Thucydides didn't even get the original situation right. Yes, there was a rise in the power of Athens, but and that may have caused the first Peloponnesian War, but that had come to an end in a truce. And um, it was the second Peloponnesian War, which is so disastrous. And that was not caused by continuing rise of Athens, but by a bunch of dumb policy mistakes uh, that the Athenians made. So uh, in that sense, I think we want to be careful not to get a, a feeling of inevitability about US-China conflicts uh, based on historical analogies. What the Thucydides historical analogy warns us, and it's useful for that, is to be careful that uh, rising powers do create fear in established powers and um, be aware of that. Uh, but if you go back to Thucydides' original proposition that the war was created by the rise of the power of Athens and the fear created in, in Sparta, uh, I'm not clear that we can do an awful lot about the rising power of China, but we can do something about not letting excessive fear develop in Washington. Uh, and that means that as we assess the U.S.-China relationship, we have to be careful to, to uh, do a, a clear net assessment in which we look carefully at our strengths and their strengths, our weaknesses and their weaknesses, and not, not believe the Chinese are 10 feet tall and succumb to fear. That's not the way you develop a good strategy. The other analogy that's, um, that's a historical analogy that's very prevalent or popular in Washington now is uh, called Cold War II or the new Cold War. And the argument here is that uh, uh, China is a challenge to us similar to the challenge that the Soviet Union presented uh, in the 1940s through 1989, and that uh, uh, we can basically learn from uh, that experience how to deal with China. Uh, we were able to contain the Soviet Union. We should aim to contain China. The trouble with that, using that analogy, is that the situations are very different. Uh, there are two types of interdependence which have uh, uh, characterized the current period, which did not characterize the Cold War. One was economic interdependence. The U.S. had almost no trade with the Soviet Union, nor did many of our allies. The net effect of that was that uh, when we wanted to contain the Soviets by restricting trade with them, uh, it wasn't that hard. On the, on the uh, in contrast, today, the U.S. itself has a half a trillion dollars of trade with China. And in addition to that, uh, China represents the major trading partner for more countries than does the United States. So the argument that you can just transfer Cold War containment from the past into a policy for dealing with China uh, ignores that. In addition, there's, a, there's another type of interdependence that's grown since the Cold War, and that's ecological interdependence. Um, nobody was worried about climate change and global warming during the Cold War, and yet today, uh, as the uh, ICC, IPCC uh, reported just this past week, 
um, there is a real threat to all countries from global warming. And it's going to be extremely costly, not just to uh, the US, if Chesapeake Bay and Florida go underwater, but also to China, if Himalayan glaciers uh, melt and rivers dry up and agricultural in central China uh, suffers droughts and so forth. So this is, a, this is a very new dimension of the relationship, which is ecological interdependence. And one of the interesting things here is that uh, it, nobody can solve this by themselves. China is now the largest emitter of greenhouse gases uh, displacing the United States. And uh, we can't solve it alone and they can't solve it alone. Um, in the book that I recently published called Do Morals Matter? Uh, Presidents in Foreign Policy from FDR to Trump, I distinguish between power over others and power with others. Power over others is the traditional form of power. Power with others means you have a problem which you can't solve unless you work with the others. And that's, a, that's another dimension of the, of the US-China relationship, which is not caught by the Cold War analogy. Um, in fact, I've used a metaphor in, a, in an op-ed I wrote for the New York Times in uh, last fall, saying that we're involved in a three-dimensional chess game with China. One chessboard, of course, is the traditional military chessboard, and that's analogous to the Cold War. But the economic chessboard, um, it, there's no analogy in the Cold War, and the ecological chessboard, there's no analogy. And the problem is that if we call this a new Cold War, we're oversimplifying the challenge we face. Or another way of putting it is you're involved in a 3D chess game, and uh, you play just normal chess, you're going to lose. So uh, I think the dangers I see is that, um, that the analogy of, of the new Cold War lulls us into uh, believing that this is a problem we can solve the way we solve the Cold War problem through a, a doctrine of containment. And uh, it's a different game. And we're going to need a much more sophisticated strategy. The third historical analogy that sometimes used in uh, or heard in Washington, Henry Kissinger has used this, and I think it's, it's a useful one, is what you might call the 1914 sleepwalkers uh, analogy. And that really um, goes back to how we understand uh, the origins of World War I, not uh, the outcome of World War II. And there, um, what you saw in the, on the eve of World War I was a, a considerable rise of nationalism in Europe, in all countries. And uh, in that sense, it's somewhat analogous to what we're seeing today, which is an increase in nationalism in China, as well as a populist nationalism in the United States. And uh, what happened with the rise of nationalism in, uh, in the, 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 the beginning of the 20th century in Europe was uh, countries um, pressed harder for their advantage. There hadn't been a war for some time and people had become used to uh, control of war. And when a situation arose out of the um, uh, Serbian nationalist assassination of the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, uh, the feeling is that, um, all right, we'll let it come to war. Uh, let's let it go. This is uh, this will clarify the balance of power, and there was a widespread view that uh, the troops will be home by Christmas. This will be a, in effect the Third Balkans War, a short, sharp war which will clarify the balance of power, and then we'll go back to uh, business as usual. Of course, um, that's not what happened. What happened was that uh, uh, you had four years of war. Uh, which led to the end of four empires and the loss of four thrones. I've often said that if you could have given these leaders a crystal ball in August 1914 and let them peek inside it and say, what's 1918 look like? And they saw that their empires had been dismembered and they'd lost their thrones. 
they might not have been so willing to take the risks that led to the beginning of the war. Uh, so in that sense, I think you could argue that in the current circumstances, the rise of nationalism in both countries, plus the uh, plus the, the the possibility of a triggering event, it's something sometimes people say it's most likely to grow out of uh, Taiwan, some efforts toward Taiwan independence or China's conquest of Taiwan. Uh, you can imagine the type of uh, uh, the argument that well, it'll be a short, sharp war which will. Uh, clarify things, uh, but it might not stop there. And uh, the one difference, of course, is that to some extent, nuclear weapons today provide uh, leaders a crystal ball that you see some devastation at the end of a nuclear war. But uh, it's not in itself sufficient to, uh, to guarantee that we won't sleepwalk into a war. So those are the three historical analogies. Thucydides uh, post-World War II, Cold War, and pre-World War I, uh, sleepwalking. Um, and each of them has its, its um, virtues. None of them is empty, but all th three of them have uh, some drawbacks, which is they oversimplify and um, they violate Ernie May's proposition of draw the line, which says similarities and, and differences. So where does that leave us in terms of, of, of a strategy for, for dealing with China? Um, I think uh, I, I tend to agree with Kevin Rudd, um, who has a, um, a new book out on, on US-China relations, uh, which basically questions whether we're destined for war. And Kevin Rudd talks about having a, uh, uh, a, a competitive coexistence. In other words, that the goal should not be regime change, which is beyond our capabilities. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we have to realize that uh, we're going to have to coexist. I've sometimes called this a, a, a cooperative rivalry which we're definitely going to be intense rivals for some time, but there are also going to be areas in which we're going to have to cooperate at the same time that we're rivalrous. But in, in any event, it's a, it's a different proposition about the, the end state than we saw from the Cold War, where uh, when uh, George Kennan proposed the doctrine of containment, it was basically a long-run doctrine of regime change. I don't know whether you'd find regime change in China or not, maybe, but I don't think it's in our capabilities to, to produce it. So in that sense, I think, um, you know, having a, uh, a competitive coexistence, which in the words of the, of the Biden administration officials, maintains a favorable balance for our interests and values, uh, that's a, 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 a usable or sensible objective for developing a strategy for the U.S.-China relationship. Um, will it work? Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, I tend to think that, in fact, the Americans have more high cards in this game than, uh, than the Chinese do. Uh, everybody sees the Chinese as uh, uh, 10 feet tall and getting stronger and stronger. I think if you look at the problems that uh, uh, Xi Jinping faces, where uh, you have a demographic uh, decline, the labor force peaked in 2015, and you have uh, factor productivity, total factor productivity, that's below the OECD average. And you have the fact that China doesn't have many allies, maybe Russia, maybe North Korea, though I don't know what sign you put on that positive or negative, um, I, you know, if I were a agent from Mars looking down at this poker hand that these two players had, the Americans and the Chinese, I'd rather play the American hand than the Chinese hand. But that's not the conventional wisdom today. The conventional wisdom is that uh, the Chinese are about to eat our lunch. Um, and uh, nobody knows the answer to that. But I think exaggerating the uh, 
the strengths or the weaknesses of your uh, opponent is a good way to produce a mistaken strategy. Now, let me just say a, a couple of words about uh, the recent events in um, uh, Ukraine. Um, but I, I try, I'll try to keep it brief. We can elaborate them in Q&A if you want. Um, if you look at the, I mean, I could have given you the talk I just gave you on February 23rd, and uh, and you might say, okay, but it's now after 20, February 24th when the Russians invaded Ukraine. How would that talk have to change? And I think uh, what we've seen as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a major change in the agenda of world politics. Um, obviously, you're seeing a, a great focus on Europe, on Ukraine, which has an effect of reducing the so-called pivot to Asia. And um, I, I think in that sense, it, uh, uh, it, it's made people focus on on uh, the, the Russians and on the Europeans, and in a way which hadn't been in the case before. And that's brought about some amazing changes. I mean, the idea that Germany would cancel the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which the Americans had been pressing them to do, and they've strongly resisted for years, and then suddenly they do that, that's, that's a big change. Or the fact that Germany would move toward a, a, a a 2% goal of, uh, percent of GDP to be spent on the military, uh, that was a big change. And the fact that NATO has held together as consistently as it has uh, since the Russian invasion, these are, these are changes, if you want, in the focus of and agenda of world politics, primarily centered in, in Europe. Um, and What's been the effect of that? <clears throat> well, one effect has been uh, to reduce Russian power. Um, the, the formidable Russian military machine, which was supposed to be able to do uh, take care of Ukraine in a matter of days, uh, now has a major puncture hole below the waterline. Um, the Russian economy, which was already limping uh, before the uh, uh, events of February 24th um, is now going to be suffering because of the sanctions. And Russian soft power, the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payment uh, is in tatters. So Russia's power has definitely declined. How does that affect China? Uh, well, to the extent that Xi Jinping has tied his fate to, to Russia, um, it means that China has a loss of power as well. Its one ally, its one major ally, is weakened, and that uh, uh, weakens China. In addition, China has to face the danger that um, if, if it helps Russia too much, it could suffer secondary sanctions, and these could have strong effects on the Chinese economy, particularly as China is finding that dealing with uh, uh, COVID with a zero COVID policy is harder than it first looked. So the net effect of that at one immediate point is that uh, the prospects of China invading Taiwan don't look as high as they might have. If Russia can't cross a land border with 190,000 troops more effectively than it did. Uh, the idea that China can launch an a uh, amphibious invasion of Taiwan doesn't look too good. So I would think whoever was whispering in Xi Jinping's ear that now is the time on Taiwan, um, uh, I think she would have the good sense not to listen to him. Um, she could find himself in an interesting position. I wrote a column for Project Syndicate, and I said, if there were really creative Chinese diplomacy, she should turn to what I call a Teddy Roosevelt strategy. In 1904, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, uh, 1905 actually, uh, basically mediated in the Russo-Japanese War, pressed hard on the parties to compromise, won himself a Nobel Peace Prize, and 
uh, greatly increased American influence. If she were to do something like this, um, he could get China out of a bind where it's undercut its own soft power with Europe, a uh, major trading partner, and uh, it could restore China's uh, position as an equilibrator between uh, Russia and the United States, uh, a little bit like Kissinger's trip in the in the 70s um, made the US an equilibrator between the USSR and China. Um, so it might be a very clever strategy for Xi. I don't think he's capable of it. Uh, I think he sees the American threat as so important that um, he's not going to put any space between himself and, and Russia. But that means that uh, as Russia sinks or as Russia's fate goes down, that affects China in the negative direction. And finally, in the narrative of world politics, there was a lot of talk um, before February 24th of the east wind prevailing over the west wind. The axis of authoritarians was taking over the future. Um, I always regarded that as excessive rhetoric. Uh, for one thing, if you add Russia and China together, uh, their total GDP is about 20% of the global total. If you add the US, Europe, and Japan together, you're talking about 50% of the world product. So the idea that Russia and China, this axis of authoritarians, was the equal of the Western democracies was exaggerated well before the events of February 24. But if in addition, you say that the myth of the axis of authoritarians taking over and the east wind prevailing over the west wind, which she used to refer to, that narrative doesn't look too good anymore. So in that sense, I think the effect of, of this has been uh, of the invasion of Ukraine has been to strengthen the American hand somewhat in the US-China relationship. But the US-China relationship is going to go on longer than the Ukraine war. And that still means we need a strategy asking, how is the world going to look in 2049? And uh, there I've tried to indicate that I think we have a reasonable hand to play if we learn to play it well. So that, let me stop there. I think that's about the halfway point. But in any case, uh, it'll get us to something which is more fun, which is Q&A. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, I plowed some of the same ground and I, I find myself uh, taking copious notes uh, with all the new insights. Um, let me go back to, to the beginning of your talk and the, the fact that uh, things change. Uh, we don't know the future. Uh, there tends to be a 20 year cycle, but Washington lock, locks itself in uh, to a mentality that seems to be pretty strongly locked in right now uh, that could foreclose opportunities in the future uh, for a different kind of relationship. Um, is there anything that we as scholars can do to encourage uh, people in Washington to uh, think about keeping open to uh, different alternatives in the future. And, and are there any things that Washington uh, could be doing to ensure that, that we're not just uh, locking out any and for, for closing any uh, possible uh, improvements that might come, say, after Xi Jinping is gone? Well, I think the, the uh, this is why I'm opposed to this Cold War analogy. It, it locks us into positions that um, will last well beyond the, the current period. I think if you, I like, this is why I like Kevin Rudd's approach of competitive coexistence. It allows you more flexibility uh, for change. I mean, it, it, imagine a, a situation in which um, uh, China does start to suffer 
uh, from droughts, which dries up agriculture, which threatens growth, which threatens the control of the Communist Party. China might decide it's probably in its own interest to become a lot more cooperative um, on some issues, both uh, climate and trade. And um, if, if so, then we should be prepared to uh, to meet them halfway if it fits our interests. Uh, but if we if we demonize them, if we see this as a cold war where the only answer is regime change, then you, uh, you mean that we're not going to be flexible enough. We're not going to have a strategy that's flexible enough to adjust to that. So I I I think the uh, I think this is why I much prefer the Kevin Rudd type approach of competitive coexistence to the analogies about uh, new Cold War. Uh, thank you. Um, we, we have uh, quite a number of questions. Uh, one comes from Bill Xiao of Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, he says, thank you for your insightful analysis uh, using historical lessons. China faces many problems in its economic growth and environment. Uh, can you elaborate what you think are the, the major ones that may not pose such a huge uh, threat to the US? Well, I think the, uh, if you look at, at the Chinese economy, um, I think it does face uh, problems that start with demography. In other words, China under Deng Xiaoping had a wonderful record of raising hundreds of millions of people out of poverty by taking surplus labor from the countryside, uh, bringing it to cities, becoming uh, manufacturing centers based on cheap labor, and exporting that in the uh, to the world as the world's manufacturer, if you want. Uh, that's coming to an end partly because of demography that. As I mentioned the labor force peaked in 2015, but also they're now uh, lower cost labor sources such as Vietnam and Bangladesh. So uh, the answer to that is there's still a large uh, source of rural uh, labor that could be brought to the, to the cities, uh, but it's not as highly educated as it needs to be to, to have the kind of productivity you need. So in that sense, um, uh, finding a way for China's finding a way to uh, raise standards of education in rural areas is, is something uh, which I think is, is good for China, but it can also be good for us, good for the world. Um, similarly, if China were, if China's health system is, uh, is stretched very thin and uh, most of my friends who study China uh, carefully say that the Chinese health system is, is, um, is not very good. I mean, it's okay in Shanghai or Beijing, but nationwide it's not. And so in that sense, improving Chinese health system um, is good for them. I know, I mean, that seems to me also good for us. So there, and if China also in public health gets a better control on uh, how pandemics like SARS um, uh, originate, uh, that's good for them, good for us. So there, there are lots of areas. I mean, there are some areas, for example, if you look at artificial intelligence, where uh, you can say AI can be used for uh, weapon systems, yes, but it can also be used for medical uh, approaches and cures to cancer. And uh, so there are areas where you can still have cooperation with China or work with China, and there are areas where you don't want to. Uh, Huawei is a great example. Of, you don't want China controlling your fifth generation telecommunications for very clear security reasons. But that, that's just what I mean by a sensible strategy distinguishes between those areas where there is a security threat where you have to decouple in those areas where, um, yes, it may help them, but it doesn't hurt us that much, and decoupling would be a wrong response. Uh, thanks. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, 
Is it valid for China to claim that its ambitions in the Asia Pacific region are not much different from the United States ambitions in the Americas under the Monroe Doctrine? Well, it's, it's, it's valid for China to aspire uh, to that in the sense that great powers often act as hegemons, but you also have to ask, how do the neighbors feel? Um, what's interesting about um, Asia is it has its own balance of power. Uh, Bill Emmett, the uh, former editor of The Economist, uh, wrote a book a decade or so ago called The Rivals, in which he said, look, Japan, India, Vietnam, these are countries that don't want to be dominated by China. So China might say, uh, we're going to have our own Monroe Doctrine, uh, but Vietnamese and the, and the uh, Japanese and others may say, that, we don't like that idea. And that's why the United States is often welcome. Uh, these are countries that want to trade with China, but they don't want to be dominated by China. And that's why they welcome an American security presence at the same time that they don't want to have a policy of containment cutting off their trade. So yeah, China can aspire to its own Monroe Doctrine, but um, it can only do so effectively if it does so with the consent of its neighbors. Thanks. Um, uh, Mark Dallas, a guest asks uh, about your comments uh, regarding economic independence. He says, aren't there key differences between economic interdependence and technological interdependence? interdependence? Uh, uh, don't we have to think of three kinds of interdependence, technological, economic, and ecological? Yes, I would, I would, I think that's correct. I would, uh... At a first rough approximation, tend to subsume the the technological technological interdependence under a form of economic interdependence. But to go back to the example I gave about Huawei, uh, some economic interdependence is good for us, and some is bad for us. So, uh, and that often is depends on the technology. The Chinese have seen this themselves. I mean. Uh, you know, when Chinese complain that we exclude Huawei or ZTE uh, from our telecommunications process, um, I always remind them that they excluded uh, uh, Google back in 2010 and Facebook and so forth. And the reason is that they wanted an internet that they could control and uh, uh, to, it wasn't a threat to the party. And uh, so they have long made these distinctions between uh, dimensions of economic interdependence, which are uh, which there's a net benefit to them, and dimensions where there's a, uh, a net threat. And we have to do the same thing. Uh, so it, if you want to say, well, let's separate a technological interdependence as a, another category, then even within technological interdependence, uh, you want to distinguish some that are a threat and some that are not. Uh, I, I'll give you that example I just cited about artificial intelligence. It can uh, it can develop it or can be used for um, weapon systems, autonomous weapon systems, and also be used to read mammograms. We have uh, two questions about Taiwan, uh, one from Irving Plotkin uh, says, what should the US do if China moves militarily on Taiwan? Uh, another uh, question from Bao Choi, a Hong Kong journalist and Harvard Neiman fellow, uh, wants to know your thoughts about the analogy between the 1914 sleepwalkers and what might happen across the Taiwan Straits. Um, he says, do you think the uh, Indo-Pacific containment effort is a good strategy to prevent war? Uh, what could be done better? Well, I, on uh, Taiwan, uh, the, the American position for years has been uh, 
uh, what sometimes calls strategic ambiguity, which is we don't declare that under all circumstances we would defend Taiwan uh, because we don't want Taiwan to think that if it declared independence, uh, which would likely provoke uh, military action by China, that we're behind this. So our position has been roughly since 72 uh, uh, or so, has been um, no unilateral declaration of independence, no use of force, and then the two sides uh, negotiate their relationships across the Taiwan Strait. Um, and that, uh, that position has, uh, with variations, pretty much held the whole time. It was interesting when President Biden um, uh, said last year that uh, we would defend Taiwan, uh, sort of an ad-libbed statement. Um, there was a quick correction from the White House saying this was uh, not a change in policy. The voters that, uh, that, the, that the standard policy remains in place. It probably didn't do any harm for Biden to remind the Chinese that we might indeed defend Taiwan under but on the other hand, you don't want to have it standing out there as a way which encourages the DPP or others in Taiwan to say, let's push harder toward independence. So I think uh, we, ought to, we ought to strengthen Taiwan's capacity for self-defense. We ought to help it become a, a porcupine or a poison shrimp. And in that sense, reduce the risk of a Chinese invasion. Uh, but I personally do not think it would be wise to give a, a absolute clear guarantee of coming to their defense uh, along the same along the lines that we have in our uh, security treaty with Japan. On, in the, on the South China Sea, um, when you get to the Senkaku Daiyu Islands, um, President Obama said that we regarded these as covered by the US-Japan Security Treaty. And that was a way of deterring uh, China. But remember, nobody lives on those islands. And so the argument that somebody was going to suddenly do something provocative, like declare independence, wasn't part of the problem. So the Taiwan situation is, is, has been a, a, a tricky one. We, you might think of it as double deterrence. We want to deter Chinese invasion and deter uh, Taiwanese uh, unilateral declaration of independence. Um, and that still remains the, uh, the policy. Uh, the other piece, Bill, remind me the second question on Taiwan. You had a, you, there were two. I, I was answering just the first one. Um, it was whether the, what he calls the U.S. Indo-Pacific containment effort is a good a good strategy for preventing war in the region? What could be done better? Um, well, I'm not sure that the administration has called it a containment policy. I think uh, it has been a, a set of alliances and uh, those alliances have been built upon the, what I referred to earlier as the existing Asian balance of power. Um, the, the administration has resisted uh, calling it containment per se. Um, another way of thinking about it is shaping the environment in which China exercises its power. It says maybe you, you can say, well, what's the difference be between that and containment? It means it, there may be some difference in the sense that we're not trying to prevent countries trading with China or we're not trying to economically isolate China as we did contain it in the, in the uh, Cold War. Um, but we want to make sure that the environment is one where states that want to preserve their independence uh, feel that the Americans are there to help them. Um, you might say, well, it's a small difference. Um, I think it, it actually makes the difference. No, oh, we have a question from Mabel Chan, who's a research associate in the Fairbank Center. She says, you mentioned the China dream rhetoric of President Xi Jinping. Uh, do you agree or disagree that it was a, a more a direct appeal aimed at a domestic audience 
and perhaps even overseas Chinese, rather than a challenge to America's superpower status. Uh, she says the American dream has been an attractive idea that sent hundreds of thousands of Chinese to America uh, for opportunities they couldn't find back home. Uh, many settled down and assimilated and never returned. As China rises, one could argue that the China dream slogan is to galvanize nationalism and Chinese American support for their motherland and to diminish the appeal of the American dream. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I largely sympathetic with that, that comment. I think that uh, the China dream is, is less a foreign policy than a domestic political support policy. And, um, but I think what Xi Jinping hasn't been sufficiently attentive to is what I call the two audience problem. That when a political leader says something, uh, there are two audiences, one internal and the other external. And sometimes you may say, oh, this is for home consumption, but you forget, wait a minute, somebody outside is listening as well. So if you look at something like, uh, uh, you know, the China dream, or you look at something like Xi Jinping's uh, statement that China will be number one in artificial intelligence by 2030. Um, well, that's great at home when you're trying to show that how well the party is doing in, in promoting Chinese nationalism and, and homeland and so forth. But you know what? There are people listening to that in Washington who say, wait a minute, you're going to be number one in artificial intelligence in 2030. Uh, we don't like that. That assumes we're number two. And that means our willingness to cooperate with you uh, in artificial intelligence is going to be diminished. So in that sense, she uses rhetoric, which may be for the reasons that, that you said, uh, but um, uh, he's, he's not sufficiently attentive to um, the fact that the external audience may hear it differently. I mean, it's, it's not unique to China. Donald Trump talked about America first. Um, well, that's understandable. Political leaders defend the interests of their own country first, but um, it, it doesn't go over all that well in the rest of the world, which means you're second. So um, I, I accept the point, the description, but I think a, 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 a a more expert leader internationally would have softened that type of, of statement. Thanks. Um, we've got two questions about nuclear issues that uh, phrased almost identically. Xiao uh, Shan uh, Shui, a guest, asks, while the US warns of China's breathtaking nuclear expansion, why is the Biden administration scrapping the nuclear cruise missile program? Do you support that decision? Well, I, do, I, don't, I, I don't know the details of that. Um, it, it might be just cost effectiveness. I don't think it's... Um, necessarily a uh, uh, driven by the US-China competition. Uh, you know, there are lots of weapons you can develop and not develop, and whether the nuclear cruise missile was worth uh, what it would cost is, uh, I think was the decision was based on that rather than not irritating the Chinese. But I don't know the answer to that. A uh, research fellow, uh, Beric, uh, I'm going to have to apologize if I mispronounce the name, Dobin Baev, uh, uh, at the Center for China and Central Asia Studies in Kazakhstan, says, uh, th thank you for your deep analysis of U.S.-China relations. My question is, what is China's strategy regarding Afghanistan, uh, how 
how uh, is Beijing trying to balance the interests of other countries in Afghanistan? Well, China has always taken a position that it wants to be influential in Central Asia. And um, on the other hand, it didn't want to import uh, radical Islamism into uh, Xinjiang and other places. And uh, so it's, it, it, it has had a long standing uh, close relationship with Pakistan, uh, which is based on China's rivalry with India. Um, so I think the, the effort in Afghanistan is to make sure that it doesn't spill over into uh, among Chinese Muslims, A, and B, that um, it will be following more or less the same policy lines that Pakistan is following toward Afghanistan, which has been, again, to avoid the worst excesses of the Taliban, but, uh, but not to alienate them entirely. So I think, I think China's trying to walk a tightrope on that. Uh, Catherine Wilhelm asks, uh, starts out by saying, if we only count China's formal alliances, we may underestimate China's influence, for example, in the global South. Uh, for many global South countries, China is both inspirational and also seems to be offering more uh, practical assistance for development. Uh, the US doesn't seem to pay much attention to the discourse in uh, developing co countries' capitals. How would you factor this in? And, and maybe I can uh, take advantage of my position to broaden that to uh, a fundamental question about the concept that, that you're most famous for, soft power. Uh, we tend to think that our democracy and freedom uh, is the ultimate in soft power. Maybe that's been damaged a bit by what we've done in the Middle East and elsewhere. Uh, China's lifting people out of poverty uh, tends to get discounted in this country as, as, a, as a, a soft power inspiration. Uh, does our di national discourse about this need to be, need some revision? Well, uh, Chinese, uh, China does have soft power, which is the ability to get what you want through attraction rather than coercion or payment. And one source of Chinese soft power is traditional Chinese culture and you know the, the glories of the traditional culture. But another source of it in more modern terms is China's economic success. I mean, China has been extremely uh, impressive in, in what it's accomplished. And I think that makes it attractive a number of others. On the other hand, um, those are the assets, if you want. The liabilities for China in terms of soft power are uh, there are two in particular. One is the uh, it has territorial disputes with its neighbors. It's very hard to set up a Confucius Institute in New Delhi about uh, getting people to admire Chinese culture if at the same time Chinese soldiers are killing Indian soldiers on the Himalayan border. And, and China has, a, what has it, 14 neighbors, uh, borders with 14 countries, and there are probably at least a half a dozen with whom there are territorial disputes. So that's a, it can downplay those disputes, uh, doesn't always do so in an era of nationalism and wolf warrior diplomacy. Um, the extent to which those disputes are played up rather than down, as the Indian case illustrates, um, uh, that costs China in terms of its soft power. The other liability China has for its soft power is the insistence on tight party control over civil society. A great deal of a country's soft power comes not from its government uh, broadcasting or whatever, it comes from civil society. 
which in the case of the United States means everything from universities to Hollywood to Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and so forth. Um, if, you, if China insists on tight party control, it undercuts a lot of those civil society institutions. And uh, that then cuts back on the extent to which China can benefit from, from soft power. So there, if, if the one way to test this, oh, I should also add a Belt and Road Initiative. In other words, China, by providing funds and loans for infrastructure projects around the world, um, uh, is uh, currying favor. I mean, it's, it's trying to make itself more attractive. And in some places that works, and in some places it doesn't. Um, in Hamban Tota, which is a port in Sri Lanka, uh, which was uneconomic and yet had uh, uh, commercial level scale loans or interest rates on the loans, um, it, it probably caused more resentment than, than attraction. I mean, in the initial stages, it, it created attraction, but with time, it, uh, it led to resentment. So um, the China's influence in the, in the uh, poorer world or parts of the world um, is, uh, it varies from place to place. Um, but, uh, and Belt and Road is an effort to try to, to increase it. But um, one way to check on this is to look at uh, reputable public opinion polls by organizations like Pew or Gallup and so forth. And what's interesting there is if you, if you look at different continents, uh, Chinese soft power is much less than American soft power uh, in Europe, in Australia, in South America, or, and um, Asia. Uh, the one area where the U.S. and China are regarded as roughly equally attractive uh, is Africa. And that varies somewhat, of course, among different African countries. So, yes, China has soft power but it also has limits on its soft power. And when we look at the results as measured by reputable polling organizations asking questions about attractiveness, uh, China hasn't got a very good return on its investment. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, uh, Jesse Jung asks, do uh, you have further comments about how the U Ukraine crisis will reshape U.S.-China relations and the global political landscape? Well, a, a lot depends on, on uh, what happens on the battlefield, also on what Putin decides to do. But I, I, I think the most likely scenario at this stage is that Putin has given up plan A, which was a smash and grab for Kyiv, and gone to plan B, which is to try to pound the east and south into submission, and then take the areas of the Donbass and maybe a corridor along the, along the southern uh, uh, littoral, um, and uh, maybe after some point declare victory and, and, um, and just hold that. Um, I think that the extent to which that will be broadly accepted is minimal. I think there's going to be a continued Ukrainian insurgency against that. And I think it'll continue to poison relations between Russia and uh, the US and Russia and Europe and so forth. The extent to which China associates itself with Russia in that, I think, uh, hurts China. In addition, if China were to go further and to actively support Russia, um, uh, it would expose itself to secondary sanctions. And that would be expensive for the Chinese economy. So I, that's my sort of central estimate of, of what could happen. But there are a lot of scenarios running from rosier than I described to uh, rougher than I described. And frankly, at this stage, we don't know which of those is most probable. Well, uh, thank you very much for all these insights. Uh, usually almost all the questions in one of these sessions relate uh, uh, directly 
to the core of the speech. Uh, in your case, they've treated you as the guru on virtually everything <laughs> in the world. Uh, and you validated that. So again, uh, thank you so much. For well, it's been my pleasure, Bill, and, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Bye.